when we're talking about, you know, we all have, you know, that there's the five main senses, but there are these other senses which we need to latch into as well, which is kind of weight of things, temperature, humidity, whatever it might be. It's yeah. all conspiring <laughs> with with all of the other senses to, to shape our navigation of the world which are, surrounds us. And if we're designing those spaces and the world around us, we need to be aware of that, surely. <laughs> Hi there, welcome at another episode of Beyond Interior Design. I'm Mark Muskins, co-founder of the Institute of Interior Impact, and together with Sven van Buren, we're here to raise the value of the interior design industry, our industry. Because if you are an interior designer, you know how much impact you can create with your designs, right? We do have the power to shape this world. And in our opinion, who has the power has the responsibility. So therefore, we need to keep exploring the quite undiscovered worlds that do have a strong connection with the interior design world or could be part of our interior design scenery to create even more impact. So today in episode 25 already, we're going to have an exciting talk with a sensory branding specialist with over 20 years of experience in multi-sensory design. He's passionate about bringing the physical and virtual worlds through a science-based sensory approach. Uh, what that means, we're going to find out soon. As the director of Full Phantom and the founder of MetaSense, he's leading a team of experts in developing strategies, assets, and experiences for some of the world's biggest and most innovative brands. For example, Heineken, Aston Martin, uh, Unilever, PepsiCo, Self Riches, and probably I forget to mention a few more. His mission is to help brands and businesses to connect with their customers on a deeper and more emotional level. A uh, level, and you know I like that. He loves sharing his knowledge and expertise through speaker engagements and podcasts. He's featured in venues such as Design Museum, School of Life, TEDx. Well. As you know, we are LinkedIn lovers, but this guy also have a worldwide social media network, including over 2 million views on TikTok. I didn't know that. <laughs> I found it out this week with preparing in my introduction. Cool. And today he is here to showcase the power and potential of multi-century design with us. Here is live from England, London, Scott King James. <laughs> Hi there. Hi, how are you doing, Mark? Yes, great. I'm excited. You? Yeah, definitely. Well up for this. Yeah, well, wonderful. Um, do you know uh, how we got in touch in the first place? I think we were introduced by uh, a, a mutual friend, uh, probably Victoria Taylor, who yes. introduced us. Yeah, um, well, that was some time ago. I know we struggled to try and find a convenient time to do this, but I'm glad <laughs> that we finally <laughs> managed to, to to do it. Maybe, what, six months later? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably, yeah. So, yeah, wonderful that you are here. Yeah, uh, for the people who know the podcast already, Victoria Taylor, guest of another episode. He was one of the previous guests, another expert to, uh, yeah, she knows how to deliver extraordinary experiences. Yeah. For example, in the hospitality world. Um, yeah, go to uh, the Beyond the Terrorism Design podcast and you will find out again uh, because wonderful podcast too. And she told me, yeah, you need to you need to speak with Scott. He can add a, a great new, quite undiscovered layer to the world of interior design definitely beyond interior design so uh yeah i want to know all about it okay. so tell me what is it exactly multi-sensory design okay so i mean it sounds like it's kind of new and fascinating and what um, and what have you but really i mean our my type of my take on it and the ultimate kind of goal of what we're doing is that multi-sensory design um is based on the fact that I, you, Mark, everybody tuning in here uses all of our senses all of the time, right? Uh, we're inherently multi-sensory beings. And therefore, if we are designing spaces, interiors, um, uh, experiences, um, products, we should be considering how what we are um, designing through all of the senses in order to meet you know, our human needs to have our senses stimulated. 
Um, so what we really do is uh, a kind of creative design practice, but our unique point of difference is that we're not doing any of this kind of arbitrarily on a, or on a creative whim. We're founding everything, founding everything that we do on scientific research. So peer-reviewed scientific research, which looks into how we operate as multisensory beings and how we can start to understand that we all have, and this is the, the kind of key point, um, universal linkages between our senses, um, which is very, very different to some of some some people refer to synesthesia, which is a neurological condition, All right. uh, which creates like a hard wiring between the senses in the brain. Um, and people can have all sorts of uh, interesting kind of cross sensory experiences. Um, you can have sound to taste. Uh, synesthesia so you will hear certain words or certain music and you'll have actual real perceptions of taste when you hear those words so um, you connect you connect multiple senses to each other in your head kind of yeah. NLP, nlp brain wired connection yeah. so so uh, but the difference is that synesthesia is kind of idiosyncratic in that if you got a room full of people that all had the condition where they had a cross wiring of uh sound to taste in the room and you played a particular piece of music or a note on a piano or said a per particular word, they would all have a reaction and, and taste something, but it would be completely different for everyone. Okay. Ah, yeah. So, so you can't really design based on synesthetic insight because it's not going to be what I experience is what is different to what you experience. But there is what we're involved in is this emerging world um, in cognitive neuroscience of cross sensory or cross modal. Um, uh, understanding which is demonstrating that we all have me you everyone wherever they are in the world hot, uh, linkages between our senses um, that are consistent so this then becomes really interesting if you're thinking about designing of a space if we know that there is a relationship between a certain color which can unlock uh, and bring to the fore a certain feeling a certain emotion even uh, encourage a certain behavior like a concentration or collaboration um, then to be able to use those insight or that particular insight in the work which we're doing is really really valuable so to come back to my point about where are we going kind of on this journey with with multi-sensory sort of approach and design it's that really it should just become best practice if we really want to design with all of the senses in mind in a way that is uh, proven and to work for everyone to stimulate the right feelings, uh, trigger the right moods and emotions, um, uh, encourage the right behaviors, and even affect in a kind of healthcare or workplace or educational setting the right kind of physiological responses, whether I'm, you know, enlivened and, and upbeat uh, uh, and want to get on and be active, or whether I want to relax, feel comfortable, and communicate more. We can yeah. deliver all of these things by taking this approach. Ah, wonderful, yeah. It, it, is, it is something, maybe it has to do with those times or something, but we, we are all yearning for something more, right? It's not, it's, it's, like, it's not good enough anymore. We want deeper layers, more experiences. It's something that can awaken all our senses. It's, it's to yeah, yeah. like to, to bring back the magic again or something. We we'll, we'll something more. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, there's no there's no sort of um, uh, coincidence that a lot of the happy memories which we have and those kind of things which we go to happened in our childhood when we didn't have these kind of worries and kind of day to day mundanity of of, of, of potentially life. It's and it's about really kind of connecting with that again, you know. As we become, as we mature from the point of birth, as we develop, our senses start to get old. They start to become less effective. So what we can do is compensate for sort of duller sensory, um, uh, a, a bit, being a duller sensory being um, by adding more into the intensity of that stimulus so that we start to unlock these magical childhood experiences, which we so richly remember. Um, and a, kind of an example of that in the work which we've done in the past. So we do a lot of work in food and drink uh, environments and experiences and, and helping restaurants and chefs develop dishes and sort of, uh, the environments that they're in and all the props and um, furniture that's within there as well. Um, but also 
experiences and design that affects the quality of the taste experience as well because frankly that's kind of you know <laughs> the majority of why you go to a restaurant is for the taste experience yeah um, so we were with uh, heston blumenthal who's a chef in the uk um when he was sort of dev devising and designing the fat duck experience now the fat duck for those that don't know used to be the number one restaurant in the world three michelin star restaurant um i think it's number seven now so i never go anymore you know <laughs> um, no it's a fantastic place and we work with him across the kind of customer experience even from you know when you go to the website to book what is that experience and kind of playing around with people's sort of behaviors and emotions and feelings as they're going throughout this um and when you're greeted at the restaurant what happens and there's a huge kind of shroud of mystery around what 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 occurs so people are a little bit kind of on edge they're not quite sure what they were going to expect but they're excited about that um, but then it's about sort of zoning in on how you can bring to the fore certain uh, qualities of the of the meal which you're having or the dish which you're experiencing. So the signature dish which we helped with, it's called the Sound of the Sea, which you may have heard of. It's this kind of signature dish which everyone talks about in the in the press now, um, and it's a seafood dish brought to the table. It's kind of uh, edible sand tapioca. There's sea foam on the on the top. Um, there's sashimi and 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 seaweed on there as well. And it comes with a conch shell. And the conch shell has an iPod in it. And peep, diners put the earbuds in and they listen to a three dimensional soundscape of being by the sea. Okay. Wow. Now, okay, that's nice. But what's it actually doing? What's the purpose? yeah? Why? Why? Yeah. Why? They're always a question. Why? Well, what we found when we took this into the lab at Oxford University with our partners over there to kind of research what's going on from a, a sensorial point of view is that that sound. So it's a it's a first person soundscape of being by the sea. So there's kind of seagulls overhead. There's the waves in the, in the distance in front of you. You can hear kind of chatter and laughter of children around you that are playing on the beach. And for most people, what it does is transport them to a memory. OK, so a place and a space in time. And what comes back first is the feeling associated with that. So most people, majority of people say, well, you know, when I listen to that, it brings back memories of usually childhood, going to the seaside with the family. Um, you know, I feel warm, fuzzy, kind of carefree feeling or whatever comes back. And then what happens is that sound, once it's unlocked the memory, unlocks all of the other sensorial aspects of that memory, which you have. So in the lab, people say, that it's almost like I can really actually smell the saltiness of the fresh air of that memory. It's almost like I can feel the sand and the shingle between my toes. And all of these things together then transpire to directly influence your experience of what you're eating. So when in people have the dish and they listen to the sound versus when they're just not listening to the soundscape, they report it as significantly fresher, fishier, better quality, and they would pay more for it than when you haven't got the sound present. So it's just an example of how we can sort of use those rich memories, sensorial memories, and use other sensory stimulus, whether it's a sound or an aroma or a texture or a material or, or certain color and, and piece of artwork to trigger these memories and connect us back with these rich feelings which we've had from, from developing and, and growing up. Yeah, it's good to hear that because it's it's a kind of insight. Because most of interior designers, we are we are we need to deal with our designs that people have some. We our philosophy is form follows meaning, but the meaning includes all those memories, this nostalgia of associations of people. Most yeah. of that, those are the struggles as the interior designer. Maybe you come up with a cool new design or a new shape or whatever. Yeah. You you're trying to. To show them what they can do for them, but when they do have memories or associations about it in the childhood, and they are negative, no way they're going to choose that design version. It's impossible. It's so absolutely get a discussion, or they don't. They they will tell you, "I don't like it. It doesn't feel good," and they say, "I don't know." Yeah, and then absolutely. I want to know why is that? Because it, I think it has to do with this emotional, all these yeah. emotions that are involved. That maybe the mother-in-law is the same Curtis. That's an easy one. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> with, playing with a friend in your childhood and they, they had the interior design and you didn't like the mom or the dad so you don't want this family home feeling inside your house yeah. from, the, from the smell when you told me about the smell I had a recognition uh, a few months ago I came with a, a, a prospect and they showed me the laundry room and immediately I was on the stairs 
of my grandma, who's not here anymore, going to the attic where all the toys are behind a kind of small curtains in the, <laughs> on the roof. And yeah. I was so excited. And the, the laundry was hanging there in the, in the, in the, in the opening of the stairs to, when you go to the attic. And that yeah. smell, it, it, well, it's, well, if you talk about goosebumps, I don't know if the camera is that close, but I, I do have that. I was literally there. I was yeah. seven, six years old or so. Yeah. And I was oh. in, the, in the home of somebody else, complete stranger. But it, it, it brought back that memory. It was so cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, um, and and the power that sort of demonstrates the power of of these to stimulate, you know, kind of feeling, uh, you know, in um, a jaw drop, goosebumps, whatever. Um, something really visceral and powerful, or what have you. Um, you know, a, a, a kind of couple of points on that. Um, first off, it's no. I love looking at language when it comes to this whole kind of area because what we've we've developed in a way of using language which in itself is multi-sensory we talk about colors um being loud for example and we all know what a loud color is it's no. in your face right but we're, we're using a, a sound descriptor to refer to uh, a color for yeah example, yeah and it, it, this kind of there's all of these uh, cross-sensory language, which we always use, which is quite interesting. So we're kind of inherently aware of all of this sensory kind of crossover, but we're not sort of consciously thinking about it all of the time. Um, so, so, well, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but because that's that's cool. People, are, most of the time, say, how, how do you want to have your new interior design or your new restaurant? Or, and they come up with kind of emotions and they, they talk about loud, I don't like loud, so and you need loud colors in here, or yeah, or whatever. Yeah, and, and sometimes they have the, the, the most fake terms, and we have to find it as an interior designer what it means to them. So how, how can you tap into that if they tell you I don't want loud colors? What what could be the what uh, what do they actually mean? Yeah, exactly. And that's the word which we do sort of as part of our process. We will carry out research to understand exactly what do we mean by all of this and start to unpick. Um what is going on at a subconscious level? Because a lot of these, these linkages and these reactions, we're not consciously aware of all the time. And therefore, traditional kind of research models don't tend to work very well. Um, an example of that, which I use, coming back to the world of taste, I don't know if anyone's on the call and they're kind of drinking a cup of coffee or something. Um, but we did a study where we put coffee, and it could be anything, it could be hot chocolate, or it can be beer, or whatever it is, in four different colored mugs. There was a red mug, a blue mug, a green mug, um, uh, uh, and a yellow mug. And asked people to taste it, and asked them, what does it taste like? It was exactly the same that, that everyone's tasting out of the mug. And across the board, people will say that it tastes sweet from a red mug, it's mild from a blue mug, and it's really weak and watery from the yellow mug. And you go, okay, so which one do you like the most? And the majority of people will point at the one in the red mug and I'll go, well, I like that the most. So then you say to them, why do you like that one the most? And they will start to make up kind of anything. It will be like, well, it's obviously hotter or it's sweeter in there or it's got better bean content in the, in the coffee or whatever. But no one ever turns around and goes, well, I like that one the most because it's in a red mug. Yeah, then mm. we know that that's the only thing which is affecting your evaluation, your enjoyment, and how you feel about the coffee which is in that mug. Um, so we need to start to conduct research, which is sort of providing these stimulus, different colors or different sounds or different aromas or whatever, and measuring people's psychological and emotional response to them. So that's the only way that we can get under this conscious kind of area of the mind to where what's really going on at a subconscious level, which is pulling these triggers and what have you. Um, so th th this shows literally how the next experience, if you just talk about the color, expect yeah? you just talk about a color, the next experience of taste, of hearing, or whatever, it will the red mark influenced all what comes next. Yes. So Absolutely. if you talk about let's let's uh, bring this red mug and you replace it for a red room, yeah. What will happen with your next experience if you are in a red room for let's say one minute? Yeah. Uh, what, how how will the world change your experience? Yeah. Well, it will be if you're in a red environment. If, if you were it, so, this is the way you need to think multi sensorially about everything. So if we can zone in on kind of color and pick apart, you know, relationships with it. But we never really experience color in an environment where there isn't a smell in the, <laughs> the environment. There maybe isn't sound. And when I talk about sound, you know, um, so all music is sound, but not all sound is music. 
And most people go straight to music if they've got a space or an environment. What music are we going to put in here? Okay. Now, the problem we encounter with music, per se, is that it's very, very subjective. So, I mean, Mark, I might say, you know, we might both love jazz music or what have you. And I am a piece of a, a piece of jazz music and an artist. And I go, I absolutely love that. You know, it's one of my favorite pieces. And you go, well, I hate that. And I'm like, what the hell? Why do you <laughs> hate that? And you say, well, you know, whenever I listen to it, back to your point about smelling the smell and bit, whenever I listen to that piece of music, I remember a really bad time or whatever. And I was in a relationship and it wasn't going well and what have you. And I don't have that. So to, to use the kind of music as a kind of uh, as a as a stimulus, which is going to work consistently for everyone is you really is it's barking up the wrong tree to use a kind of, kind of phrase, because we need to be thinking about more what the sound is, what the acoustics are within that environment. If we've got a sound bed within that space. So one of the things which we use um, quite often is spaces that can be quite open large high ceiling uh minimalist kind of design tend to be quite austere when you walk into them and this is classic when you approach it from a kind of art gallery or a car dealership when you go to an aston martin dealership in the past the space is big and open and the cars are in there presented like pieces of artwork okay it's kind of like i don't want to go near those cars. don't touch it yeah, don't yeah touch i don't want to touch it, it. yeah but, you know there's a there's a conflict there because Frankly, the dealership wants you to touch it and get into it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> then you're going to more likely to buy it if you can afford such a... Such yeah. A Again, you, you're adding an, another sense uh, you're adding to another the experience. Sense. Yeah. But the problem is that the environment is premiumizing the cars because it's what you would expect in an art gallery. Oh, wow. No wonder it's got that price tag on it and how rare it is and what have you. Um, but it's not encouraging interaction. But we can use sound in that space uh, just the low sound bed of kind of chatter, but just below the threshold of hearing or whatever, which you're not consciously aware of, but makes that visually visual space in form and shape uh, inherently more welcoming so that you are it's a warmer environment. And what this is to demonstrate how multisensory design really works when you do it properly. It's that you're considering how what you're doing through each of the senses has an effect to make sure that potentially what you're doing through one sense, so for example, in this case, we're using physical design of the space and color within it to make it premium and luxury and kind of uh, um, uh, uh, in keeping with what the brand is about. And the yeah, but that, that's, that's just a statical. Right? You, don't, you don't use more senses than that, just visual. Just visual. But then we can think about, actually, we want to we want to keep that, but we want to soften this space off a bit. How do we do that? Then we can look at sound and aroma and other sensory cues to deliver that effect, as long as they work in harmony with one another, um, based on the science so that nothing's conflicting. And that is a very simplistic sort of example of how you start to build up these multisensory experiences based on the science, knowing that what you're doing is having the desired outcomes and effects, perceptual, behavioral and physiological in a way where nothing is conflicting with anything else, which back to my original point, to me, shouldn't necessarily be labeled multisensory design or anything. For me, that's just really good design. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's like if you talk, you talk a lot about sound. So that's a kind of um, well, we don't we don't design sounds. You can design the customer experience. Yeah? As we we like to uh, design with sessions on site with the client in their home. Yeah. So you immediately get their uh, th their smell, their sound, sometimes their music. Sometimes they, they, you literally take a nap when uh, Sven and I are designing, and we tell them, uh, uh, "Well, we we are going to design two hours. Take do whatever you want." Uh, feel like home yeah uh, and 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 they just they are really comfortable in their own space because we do know when they were in our studio in our home or whatever where we are designing it's a strange environment yeah so we do know they are opening up way more i can invite them in my studio to do a first meeting but i want to smell their place i want to yeah, yeah. i want to touch it i want to experience it if you are if i'm coming in there and there is classical music on on the first meeting on the background, I'm a little bit like, oh, I have to 
B, yeah. it says something to you. Yeah. yeah, a little bit more rational. That's my association, but I, I do feel like that. Sure. If I'm really energetic and the doorbell rings and then I get this classical silent over there, I I will tone down. Yeah. And you get Absolutely. it. But if I need to design for those clients, and that's funny, sometimes I don't do it always because it's not in my system, but I I do it once in a while. I put on the music they are preferring. And I get in another shape. If I'm designing with jazz music, I will definitely get another design in hard rock or whatever. Yeah. Or beach lounge or so if I tap into the feeling and even the sounds with the music, yeah. I do get a better design, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think if you are you measure it, could that be proven actually? Yeah, that's the next step. That's that would be the next step to kind of add rigor around what basically you're doing, which is a research exercise by going to yeah. their, to their space. Yeah, I want to feel how they want to feel. That's yeah. what that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, and you and and what well, that's exactly the same. So the research, I guess, in your process, you have the research stage where you're visiting them, you're starting to understand what their likes and the, the you know what the objective is for the space, their wants and desires, and what have you. Learning a bit more about them kind of emotionally uh what existing kind of kind of you know a bit like the the example of an aroma that will trigger a certain response or a liking of music and what have you again music can be um sort of devices and subjective or what have you but we often when we're introducing sound use soundscapes rather than music you know so the sound of a dawn chorus of birds or whatever i mean i've never met anyone ever that said i really hate the sound of birds or whatever it yeah. just because it makes us it connects us to something which is very evolutionarily strong it was like yeah. the sound of the dawn was the sun rising and safety it's primal you know, it's a primal feeling it's, it's in, a primal it's feeling still in in here yeah yeah which is universal yes it's learned um as we've evolved but some of these other cross-sensory relationships are just there we don't understand where they've come from um people sort of hypothesize about what 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 might be the case you know we were talking about the um the coffee cups in red um enhancing perception of sweetness why that exists don't know there's certain theories about it you know maybe it's that we learned when we are hunters and gatherers that when fruit was at its ripe and most nutritious for us uh, and berries they would turn red or kind of purple or whatever who knows but the yeah. fact is that's undeniable is that we all universally have an intrinsic linkage between that particular color and that particular flavor or taste yeah. um and that's well, if you, yeah where you are if you go back just up to the aesthetical aspect it's a it's a big difference if you have a, a, a ceramic mug which can look really creamy it's almost a cream that it will show but yeah. when you have this one with it with with a golden a glass with a golden round around it it's much you want you are willing to pay way more for the golden parts maybe on top of it yeah but I would, the suggest, I would suggest thinking multi-sensorially though that if you had both aesthetically looking exactly the same and this has been proven as well with bold yeah. and, and what have you you have one that's exactly the same but it's or different like with your example there if you had the gold one but it was quite light when you lifted it up weight wise, yeah and you had the other one and it was really heavy you would pay more for the one which was heavier than the one that is lighter so when we're talking about, you know, we all have, you know, that there's the five main senses, but there are these other senses which we need to latch into as well, which is kind of weight of things, temperature, humidity, whatever it might be. There's yeah. all conspiring <laughs> with with all of the other senses to to shape our navigation of the world which are, surrounds us. And if we're designing those spaces and the world around us, we need to be aware of that, surely. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah, it's the same with chairs. Huh? Most people, when they buy a dining chair, and it yeah. feels heavy. They think it's it's heavy. It's it's steady. It's quality. Yeah. And when they do have a really light one, they are like, mm, I don't know if they if this yeah. will Definitely. last. It's strange resistance because he- yeah, resistance and heaviness tends to yeah. indicate kind of quality and premiumness. In the world of cars, you will find that the, the, this, if you want a really powerful car then the, the resistance, the spring that's underneath the accelerator will be more resistant so that you have to press it harder to go faster. And yeah. that indicates that it's a more powerful vehicle. It's nothing to but, do with the CC of the engine or anything like that. No, no, that's so stupid about it. It's something yeah, yeah. In, in our minds and we can't help it. It's we are wired like that. Yeah. And it can be completely a myth. 
Exactly. It can be false. It can be not true. It's yeah. it's funny, but we need to deal with it. Absolutely, and I, 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 we stand at a an, a point in time and and uh, now with technology and the availability of um, uh, sort of lighting systems and uh, connected homes, where you know you can create choreographed multi-sensory experiences so that one space can almost be a chameleon it can change based on what your usage of that space you want it to be so think i mean let's take an uh, we all a lot of us work from home now um or, or spend a certain amount of time at home but we may still have meetings within that space as well so there are times within our space or our study environment where we would want to be kind of concentration and focus and what have you and yeah. then we know the colors shapes sounds materials textures or whatever that will encourage and improve levels of concentration and focus but at other times you don't want that you want it to be fun collaborative bit playful or what have you and we know the color shapes forms textures lighting etc that will encourage that so if we want to have a single space where we can control some of these uh sensorial aspects so at a flick of a button or a slide of a of a of a of a, a, a button on an app or something like that, we can use Philips Hue or whatever light bulbs to change the the color, the ambience color of the room. We can use that to integrate with a different soundscape and the volume of that at the time. We can use sort of the um, evolving and controllable nature of the environment to suit the particular need requirements or the function of that space at any point in time so yeah. that's quite interesting from an interior design point of view that it isn't just static in terms of sensorial design we have this really great opportunity nowadays at really pretty minimal cost um, to at least start to introduce some of these controllable aspects within the environment such that we can match it to what our particular usage requirement is of that space at any point. So you mean uh, you mean that you can connect smart watches with your lights and sounds and all these kind yeah. of yeah you can measure literally how your physical yeah absolutely and how it respond to that or if you know in advance you know I really want to relax this evening I've got friends around or whatever you can set the room to the optimum setting yeah uh, for that to engender yeah. the best possible evening you know. I think every interior designer would love to push one button and change the environment immediately, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there yeah, is yeah. one day, one day I wake up and I want to to, to have an open glass house and I want to experience all the nature outside and the fresh air. Yeah. And then, and and the, there could be moments that you would like to be in a cave for a few hours to absolutely stick in your own world, and that's not possible in the same environment. Eh? It depends on that on the weather, on the temperature, on you know you have so many aspects. Absolutely, but it's not it's not far off when we're going to have the quality of technology in that where the, the, there is this blurring of the digital and the real world or what have yeah. you. And you can use a lot of these things through digital um, screens and and experiences. Um, it's it's some way off when it's available at scale and it's prohibitively expensive at the moment, but it's coming. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love. I was talking with the guys at Sphere. You know, in Las Vegas. Um, this huge golf ball sort of design or whatever and what their the, the capabilities and that that of within the interior of that to have these choreographed experiences where the environment completely changes even in terms of temperature and to even zone kind of sound in different areas of the auditorium you've got fifteen thousand people in there and you can have a certain even down to the rows and the blocks of the seats or whatever hearing com something completely different to what you've got in a different environment at the same time so personalized unified experiences it's really i mean everything's well, starting to turn on its head now you know it's it's coming that's what yeah. you're telling me it's coming this it's in coming. individual experience we're all in the same room we're all together but we are experiencing you can control the experience yeah, to get out to get out the most or to influence people in a good way or bad way we, yeah, we will see <laughs> Which is yeah. great when you, when you start to think of applications of, of this type of technology where we've we've done some work in this within the workspaces where you have open planned workspace, right? And you have a cluster of desks for one particular function of the business and across an aisle in an open plan, you've got a cluster of desks for another function of the business. In this case, it was legal, okay? Legal department sat on one side 
uh, who are all about, I want it quiet, I want it kind of like focused because it's a lot of detail kind of work and what have you. Yeah. Across the across the um, corridor from them in this open plan space was marketing. They are not quiet. They are very loud. They're always talking, always standing up. And there was tension between these two. What can we do about it? So we can use, in this case, sound and aroma to create a space that is you, you, sort of suitable for both. So in that example, we know that the sound of chatter or what have you, a human murmuring or what have you, has this really interesting effect. We, there was a study done where um, it was levels of anesthetic given to people that were undergoing surgery. Um, and for the um, one group of people that are undergoing surgery, they just had somebody next to them just whispering into their ear the whole time. It's nothing in particular, just this human babble, the human kind of murmur. They required significantly lower anesthetic and pain medication during the procedure, right? So there's something that is releasing the body's yeah. own internal morphine, right? So the endorphins are being released and the dopamine is being released or whatever, just when we hear that. So we can use the, the kind of chatter and murmur of voices or whatever within an environment to make us feel more relaxed. But at the same time in this workspace, if that's you uniform across both of these environments, so the the marketing space has this soundscape, and also the uh, uh, legal space has the soundscape. The marketing people don't feel so bad about getting up and having a chat because it's going to disturb the legal guys because there's this existing yeah. murmuring sound bed, and when they do do that, it doesn't stand out because you don't notice it as much because it blends into the manual chatter. So the legal team are able to concentrate more. And we then had two different aromas introduced into this env environment. One for the legal team, which was more about, it had notes of peppermint um, within it and, and some other ingredients, which instill levels of focus, clarity and productivity and concentration. And another aroma is gently dispersed over the over the, the other side of the space, which is for the marketing, which is a more more floral notes and, and that. And we know that floral notes are uh, increased levels of talking, talkability, communication amongst amongst people yeah. as well. Um, we don't, and and this is simple stuff, right? Mo how many rooms do you go into that have uh, flowers within the space? And we yeah. usually just think about the flowers as aesthetically interesting, yeah. or the colours, yeah. whatever. But the aroma of, of individual different types of flowers has a different physiological and uh, emotional effect on us. So just think a little bit more about why am I putting these particular flowers in this space? Because the aroma that they admit and they're diffusing yeah. is yeah. going to have an effect. Same, same with those uh, candles. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Candles are. They, oh, we, 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 uh, in, in a lot of the yeah, portfolios, you see candles are uh, uh, lighting up, of course. But yeah. if, when you are literally in the room, you can add those aromas really easy yeah. to at least um, the, the, to, to, to have the, the best first experience in the new house. That's yeah. how I'm, I'm just thinking like, what can we do with it? Because it's, it's a discipline. It's for sure another discipline. Aroma sounds. You you tell me that it's not an easy thing. Like hey, put on. Uh, yeah, well, it is. Put on the right music, and you will get it. You know, you need to know what is the right music for them. Yeah. Sometimes individually. Yeah. But if you, and, and, if you talk about interior design, it's yeah. You can influence it already with flowers, with candles, because they do have those aromas involved. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people with uh, fresh new leather chairs or couches or something like that, eh? they are really craving what is new with the cars, men and cars for sure, women and cars, they do have it. But it's it's a, this leather smell. They talk about the smell of new. Yeah, the smell yeah. of new or the smell of luxury or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, they have associations with it. Yeah, yeah. And there are certain, well, you know, luxury is an interesting one. People will often say in terms of design of a space, they go, well, I want it to see, be really luxurious and what have you. And you go, well, what do you actually mean by that? It's yeah, well, it's sensorially, it's meaningless. It's kind of like, you know, so. So what do you mean? Yeah, a lot of time it's spent kind of zoning down on what do you actually mean by that? But to your point regarding aromas for luxuriousness, there's a certain note. Uh, or ingredient within uh, perfumes. So it's used in Chanel number no. five and all these really kind of iconic, luxurious perfumes. That when you introduce that into a space, people go, well, this is really premium and luxury in here. And they don't really know what they mean. Hmm. Um, 
And it's so it's taking those sort of insights in and, and building in those. If you were developing a fragrance to be within a space, well, maybe we should think about using that particular ingredient within it because it will give it this rounded, luxurious feeling as well. You know. Well, tell, tell us tell us a secret, uh, Scott. Which aroma is it? Because we can just put it in the room with our high end clients. I'm afraid it's nothing that you can easily purchase or whatever off the shelf. <laughs> Of course not. Of course, of course not. It's not. No, it yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, well. Let's talk uh, after the podcast, uh, Scott. I want to know it. Yeah. No problem. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start a, a product line with this, uh, with with this fragrance <laughs> interior design fragrances for high end clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's see what happens. If I we'll just put, if, 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 if you, yeah, if you go to the first live meeting with your clients, you just put it on your shirt, and they think, hey, he or she is an high end client, high end uh, interior designer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I really don't. I don't. I didn't really like him, but he was very luxurious. So yeah, he was very luxurious. <laughs> yeah, even when he came in his jogging suit or jumper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the smell was more uh, attractive. Yeah. Well, um, um, what I just for the last part, uh, Scott. Uh, people are searching because um, you had some research is uh, done and you found them that people are searching for something in brands right now and experiences in businesses. Yeah. It's not like they are good or they are uh, trusting what they promise. Yeah? Sometimes that I do promise that you will end up with a wonderful interior design and uh, I'll just manage all the struggles uh, in the construction phase and they they do not buy you just because you fix things or can manage it manage it. Not buying on your promises if they trust you. What what is it that they are looking for at the moment? Uh, there's huge amounts of research and reports coming out um, at the moment um, that are finding, and this is internationally. So we're all humans, right? There are cultural differences between us and nuances, but we all operate in pretty much the same way. And as it should be no surprise after being locked up in our houses for you know a couple of years that and being basically sensorially deprived, that the number one demand at the moment is for rich, multisensory and exciting kind of novel experiences. Um, the interesting thing for us is that we immediately go to positive experiences. Yeah, actually, there's a real interest and a crossover coming from the world of entertainment. I mean, who doesn't love a great horror movie or what have you mm -hmm. um, into kind of negative experiences or things that instill fear or negative or are perceived as negative emotions and feelings because it's just novel and different. It's almost like we've been released back into the world. OK, stimulate me, you know, because I have. So we're looking for the extremes. We're looking for the extremes. Um, but I would caveat that by saying that you can go too far obviously yeah <laughs> yeah obviously so whilst there is a bounce back the other way you know um it's natural that if you're deprived of something you want an extreme amount of that and an intensity to it but it will come back down to reach a, a happy equilibrium no problem yeah and i read in one of your uh, linkedin posts that people are looking for joy yeah Absolutely. Just a, a joyful brand, almost 63% or so, they're looking for joy in a brand. So it's not yeah. like serious, well, I, I, you I, have I a really serious topic or a serious demand for somebody who's an expert on something. But when there is no joy involved, well, maybe they, they just say, oh, that's not for me. Yeah, that's absolutely. amazing. I mean, you can be yeah, a I mean, serious yeah. expert in the world, but if you're not joyful, people will not work with you. Yeah, a joyful experience is something that attracts others. You know, there's an inherent attraction to something that derives a positive uh, or, or is delivering a positive experience for us. Um, you wrap that up in, you know, there are many benefits of technology or what have you, but at the same time, we are we have never been so bombarded with kind of audiovisual content that to do something which actually I would say in joyfulness or what have you is connecting us back to ourselves really um, and the number one way of doing that is sensorial awareness so there's this huge growth over the past five or six years in mindfulness you know there are apps with hundreds of millions of users now doing meditation each day and yeah. the number one aspect of mindfulness is that you are more aware in the moment of what your senses are telling you so you know intuition intuition yeah we call it you know i don't know what they probably have some sayings in dutch as well but you know it'll be gut feeling or or what have you yeah. all of these things our our are as a result of this unconscious absorption 
and of information from our, through our senses that come together and form a feeling, whether I like somebody or I don't like somebody, whether I like this product or I don't like this product, whether I feel comfortable within this space or I don't feel on edge within this space, which we would refer to as a gut feeling. Um, and personally, I'm sure everyone can recount many, many occasions when they haven't trusted their gut feeling and what tends to happen, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this so is another it's... example of trust your intuition and your senses because that information is being decoded on an unconscious level and leading you to a, a feeling and a reaction and a behavior. Yes. So if you're really conscious about that, you know how to act yeah. on something you're in, you're in tune with your senses basically yeah so it's really good to be conscious another another thing to be be really conscious about yourself uh, that's absolutely. yeah, yeah. Uh, you yeah. you will make other choices yeah you you know what's good for you you will uh yeah, yeah. and so i always think about if you see people on the other side i do uh experience that for sure with uh, my coaching sessions you can see faces the energy on the other side hey, people are shoulders up shoulders down they're up the blushes red hats white hair yeah well if you are conscious with your clients when you are uh showing them your interior designing you, you see that they are really excited or not excited but scared yeah eh? maybe the same people can have really high uh high heart rate uh, they can be sweaty, they can be like, but they can be really excited and they can be really nervous. They do have the same, uh, if you mess with it, it's the same emotion almost. Yeah, but there's a difference. And if you see that, you can, and you you ask them the right question on that moment. Hey, I can see you are, or is it true you are experiencing this and this feeling? Yeah. It's yeah. for most of the time, that's the hook to these, to know what to do next or to sure. adapt the design or knowing that you are exactly on the right Way. Sure. sure. So this, yeah. this sensorial awareness is 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 something we should be doing not just personally or for ourselves, but no. in everything which we do and incorporating that an awareness and an attention to detail of what is this place, what is this space going to smell like with these furniture within it after I've done that? Is that right? Yeah. It, is that right? You know, because it's something we may have overlooked. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think, yeah, you definitely showed it that it is an, an, another expertise, another sensory we can uh, add, but then really conscious. Mm -hmm. Is it, um, how can you start with it? Well, we talk about fl flowers and maybe the candles and uh, think about the materials, how they already smell it. You like the PVC plastic floors, you know that when the floor is there, it already says really plastic, yeah. obviously. Yeah, if they want the, if they want this wood experience, they, you know, they're going to experience wood if you have a plastic Wood well, imitated it, it, floor. Yeah, I think it just it it literally starts, and we get challenged with this in our kind of commercial work, which we do. You know, everyone thinks we're going to go in all guns blazing, saying for a brand you need to do this and that, and it stimulate every sense and what have you. And of course, you can't. But budgets can be prohibitive. Actual feasibility of changing packaging of a product or whatever must be. You know, it, we don't have the, the 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 tooling in the factories to be able to do that and what have you. So it's always working in with constraints. So it's identifying the kind of constraints to what we want to do, being clear about that, what is possible, and then marrying that with what are the objectives, what are the functional, social, emotional kind of objectives which we're looking for. And once you have those two things kind of distilled, then you have what you need to know in conjunction with your research of visiting clients and understanding them a bit better um, to start to piece these things together. You know, and yeah. starting with small steps. So uh, I was always going to put a door. There's always going to be an entrance way into this. Okay, what is that? You know, let's think of the materiality of it, the handle of it. How is it? How are all these aspects working in harmony? Once I open that door, what is the smell there? What is the sound of this space? What is the acoustics within this space? Are there flowers? Is there an aroma within the space? So it's thinking, sort of aesthetically, but also multisensorially, um, at each point. And not trying to force it, just questioning the rigor of why have I decided or why am I suggesting that that particular element is within the design? How is it working? Is it working in harmony with what everything else which I'm defining here? Is it working towards the objective which we set? Is it feasible within the constraints which we've set for ourselves? And if you're getting a tick for those kind of things, 
do it. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Fun. Well, we always add, but that's a visual part, items into the drawings, into the designs that connect with this uh, meaningful moments they want to create in a new next lifestyle almost, or the next new home or next new restaurant. I put the items in there in the 3Ds to influence and to get the positive associations with this, with, hey, this is the coffee moment you're going to experience yeah. Yeah, in the sunshine with this red mark or whatever mark it is for them to have this Full experience and they can already do that but i think i am going to add a new element on the checklist when we uh, realize a new project it's like hey how is this going to smell yeah and what music maybe do we want to put on when they are entering the room or, or maybe what kind of music do we want to give them as a kind of option uh, like hey listen to this playlist eh? you know yeah. you're, you're getting in the mood in a new interior design. this is exactly what you need to listen to experience what we uh yeah. yeah the music or the soundscapes like we were saying you know yeah soundscape yeah cool word there uh, by the way soundscape yeah oh, yeah. Like <laughs> yeah wonderful um yeah yeah thank you uh scott i know you have to go for uh for our next yeah. meeting so i want to wrap this up um definitely beyond the terror design uh if people do have questions can they uh reach out to you on linkedin yeah sure 100%. yeah because yeah, yeah, you're really uh, really popular on LinkedIn too. So uh, people, Scott uh, Scott King on LinkedIn, you can find him there if you have any questions. We will prepare a, a special page for you. It's uh, instituteofinterioryimpact.com slash Scott. They can find more information about uh, about you over there. They can connect with you uh, over there. So uh, an yeah, extra information do. about the podcast, the replay will be there. So uh, we are going to do that for you. And yeah, thank you because, well, it's if we want to create more impact with interior design, a more rich, immersive experience, we definitely need to think about more than just the visual aspect, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Light is a uh, kind of obvious one to uh, get in the right mood, but touch and smell and sound, those yeah. are uh, maybe touch. Touch is a familiar one, but yeah, well, sound and smell are definitely new. Sound and smell and taste. We're not designing it. Yeah, and taste, yeah. This yeah. is an interesting one. You can have a lot of fun with taste, you know, in dining spaces and what have you. Yeah, yeah. If you are in hospitality yeah. and uh, yeah, restaurants, yeah. that's definitely the way to go. Yeah, yeah. it uh, it can lead to more memorable and enjoyable moments, right? Sure. That's what you're creating. Yeah, you that's what the it. science shows. If you take a multisensory approach, then things become more memorable uh, and they stimulate emotions more effectively. Um, and generally most of the well all of the upsides are good and positive so yeah not try it yeah all upsides yeah. yeah thank you so much yeah thank you scott no problem yeah uh well i told you people thank you for being here uh listening and uh, joining us live here on the video uh, podcast and when you are listening to the podcast uh, online on spotify uh, google play whatever apple uh thank you so much too hope to uh, see you in the next episode uh, and I told you this was episode 25, a great milestone already. Imagining it was not even our plan to start a podcast. It just happened. Uh, true story. So that's cool. And right now I can't wait to the next one already. I love to do this. This is my playground. Uh, but talking about milestones, uh, last week we've reached the 200,000 boundary in the LinkedIn group beyond the terror design. Uh, well, we're not. We're just a few days later, five or so, and we already have fifteen hundred more. So this is amazing. What's going on here? It's it's crazy, and I think it shows how we, as humanity, as creatives, uh, interior designers, architects, are craving for more, for more like like uh, something to be different, uh, for change in the world, uh, to make this world even better and even more beautiful. So. Uh, well, keep uh, doing the good stuff, the good work, and involve all those extra layers in our interior design field to uh, create even more impact. I think that's our goal as creatives. Um, so, well, if you're not a member yet, it's free. Check it out now. LinkedIn, the Beyond Interior Design Group, uh, because we are here to take your interior design studio to the next level. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.